um, you sort of collaborate with experts to get specialized pathway information. Um, I just was curious as to what's the nature of that collaboration? Like I guess what I'm getting at is how how is that incentivized for them? Okay. Well, Henning is here and I think it's better if he explains the stuff. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thanks. So, um, the incentive, uh, incentivation, unfortunately, is basically not there. It is more or less voluntary. So what, well, or it is voluntary. So what happens is when we um, identify we want to allocate a specific pathway, we then go through the current literature to try to identify the main experts for that pathway. Then we contact them and ask them whether they would be willing to help us represent their pathway in an electronically accessible form in real film. And then we, once we have found um, somebody willing to work with us, then we ask them for the basic pathway layout and they can choose to provide that in a suitable form. Most often it is a handwritten diagram and a file of review papers. Then the curator will work from these, will um, follow all the um, references or the relevant references from the um, review papers to really identify the underlying um, experimental evidence wherever possible and if we don't find experimental evidence for a certain reaction then this is really marked but we try to always go back not only to the review but to the actual experimental paper which as you can imagine is not that easy for something some enzymatic test which was done in the 60s. Sure, sure. Um, but so that's how the curator then prepares the data Okay. and puts it into the real um, data infrastructure and then we contact the domain expert again, we provide him with a view of um, this is how we represent this in real -term. what do you think? The um, um, expert will correct this, after that feedback, then there might be corrections, so it might go through a couple of revisions and once that's done we then identify a second domain expert as an external reviewer and go through the same sort of revision cycle again to make sure that it's not only one person's specific view. And once then both external domain experts are happy, then the pathway is basically tipped off and released. So it's a fairly elaborate process um, which is comparable to writing a scientific review paper. Sure. Um, in fact, it, the end is computationally accessible and will be part of the real database. So that's how it works as an outline. In practice, what often happens is that, let's say, new curation staff um, which joins the real team they, if they bring in their expertise, they might be um, a double function as well to the, um, the domain expert for what is their expertise. Mm -hmm. so it's not always somebody external, but there's always at least one external. Sure. Might also be the other way around that um, an internal domain expert might act as the reviewer. Um, but that's basically it. The only incentive we can offer is we try to prominently show um, who has who is the author of the pathway and we assign DOIs to the pathway so it is a referenceable piece of work. And hence we are of course very interested also in um, current in the current discussion on how to make such contributions better visible, better citable and better attributable. Mm -hmm. We recently participated in a little study I funded by the DOI Foundation, uh, where we just, no, sorry, not the DOI, by ORCID, where we assigned um, ORCID identifiers to all current 
um, external authors and also the Ethereum curation team. And mm -hmm. we now try to, where possible, um, also list the ORCID of the contributors. Again, um, the background of making things better, creditable, and hopefully at some point um, a good pathway curation uh, contribution will count almost as much or as much as um, a review on the same topic in a printed form would be. Mm -hmm. And of course we also try the other way around. Once we have done all the work, then occasionally we also publish a paper which is on which is really a review on that pathway, but then with a difference that it's possible. Okay. Okay. So you have several yeah, things yeah. in place. Yeah. Sorry? I said I just saw I was reiterating you have several things in place it looks like. Because this seems like an important point that like you said we need to discuss because this knowledge, this highly specialized knowledge is critical really for the development of these tools. And it's difficult to engage um, that community sometimes. So these are this is all very helpful. Thank you. Yes, and we are very, very, I don't know who is on the line, but we are very interested in offers of contributing knowledge to this process because it's really on the curation side, the external domain uh, experts are the limiting factor. It's more the limiting factor than internal curation capacity. Of course, we are mm. a handful of people, but we spend an awful lot of time in sending out um, invitations um, to contribute to one uh, domain expert after the other and going through the whole list or then we have readily edit uh, completely ready pathways in the database which then um, don't get released for months because um, we don't find that it's going to review them. So if within the, uh, this project we could get access and contribute from um, domain experts. That would be extremely valuable for us and I think would also really increase the value of Reatom tool for the domain, I guess, mm -hmm. the ideology, um, to really provide better analysis out of it. Mm -hmm. And it would also be a very nice joint output. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I looked in separate. Dr. Carol E. Watson. Here are her vitals. She's board certified, specializing in internal medicine with expertise in several areas. Dr. Watson is a highly experienced doctor with 19 years of practice in the field. He is affiliated with the top rated hospital.
Brian? Uh, this is, yes. is Brian on the call? Uh, yes. Hi, hi, Carol. Hi, Brian. It's Carol Watt. Hi. Um, is uh, Naresh presenting at 8 o'clock? Uh, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, it's about time to start the meeting. So uh, let's begin. So good, good morning everyone uh, for those in the US and good afternoon to everyone in the UK. Today we will have uh, two presentations. The first one will be about the Navia expert system and the second one will be about using patient information. Uh, today's presentations uh, are scheduled to end at 9. So our first presentation will be around 40 minutes and the second presentation will be about 20 minutes. These conferences will be recorded and will be accessible online once we have processed them. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type, type it in the message box provided in the application. Are there any questions? Okay, we'll wait a few minutes uh, before Naresh arrives. Uh, he'll, he'll be here in a couple minutes and then he'll start the presentation. I have a question. Um, the, the one you said recorded, where can we access it? Where can I put in the cap the session? That Brian, did you hear the question? There was a very faint question. I could just about hear it about where to access the process ones. Oh, we didn't. We didn't hear the question. Uh, the process access the process what? Yes, I don't know who asked it, but I could just about hear it. Oh, because yeah. you didn't I mean, hear it. If you could type it into the chat box, whoever whoever said that, it'd be easier for us to respond. So the question is easy. It's just where can we access the previous presentations? You said they are um, accessible somewhere. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll put a link uh, in the chat box. Just a second. Yeah, we'll type it in the message box. Yeah, it was me, Reza. I don't know if my microphone setting is wrong, but... Okay. Uh, so while that's going on, uh, we'll start our first presentation. So our first presentation will be presented by Naresh Ramarajan. Naresh received his MD at Stanford School of Medicine. He's currently a UCLA Star Fellow and PhD candidate in medical, medical informatics. He's also the founder and chief medical officer of Navia Network. Today, Naresh will present about the Navia expert system, which uses informatics to make evidence and experience-based expert treatment decisions. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Nuresh. Hello, thanks everyone for uh, giving us this opportunity to present uh, um, our work. Um, I have uh, Gitika Srivastava, who is a close collaborator of mine over the last five years on the call as well. So just by way of background, I think, uh, let's see, where do I, that one? Okay, great. I'll just wait. Okay, there we go. Um, just by way of background, I think, uh, so thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, my background is uh, in emergency and internal medicine, and I'm currently uh, a critical care fellow here at UCLA. I've been at UCLA for the last six years. And I'm also starting a STAR Fellowship in Medical Informatics. And uh, I actually met Githika Srivastava, my close collaborator and co-founder in this endeavor, um, back uh, at Harvard in undergrad, uh, where she did computer science and then started uh, a company in distributed networking called Skyris Networks, which was later acquired by Draper Fisher Jubertson, and finished her MBA uh, at uh, MIT in 2009. And since 2010, we've been working together uh, to actually build an expert system that can answer complex clinical questions. And the reason we re actually started that was that because both of us, quite a few years, about four or five years ago, had very complex decisions to make with oncology with our family members. And we had to go through a lot of data dredging, a lot of consulting different experts to come up with the right answer. And we figured, is there a better approach to make these answers in a more scalable, more immediate fashion? 
So the premise of our system is to basically use clinical informatics to make evidence and experience-based uh, decisions. Uh, so why use clinical informatics at all to enable complex clinical decisions at the point of care for physicians, for patients? Well, an informatics approach, and you know, this audience already clued into this, so I'll be brief here, but basically we believe that it can account for the uniqueness of a particular patient, look beyond just the five or ten clinical variables that a physician might be using to, you know, maybe 50 or 80 variables that may make a patient particularly unique. Um, it's much better at calculating, you know, uh, risk-benefit trade-offs and be able to actually predictively model what the efficacy and toxicity of a treatment <coughs> is from a group of different patients who may have undergone similar treatments. It's a lot more timely and scalable to use an informatics approach to make better, to enable better decisions. And uh, finally, uh, the thought process would be that if you use an informatics approach, you can be much, much more exhaustive and go through a lot of the evidence and the guidelines and experiential data that we've collected um, across the world, which to an individual practitioner is, is actually very difficult given the information explosion that we have. So what's our approach to actually making these decisions? We take three different buckets of information that we feel are unique and distinct. The first is empiric data from randomized control trials and international guidelines, things that are actually published. Uh, we also look at experiential data from all these different uh, tertiary care centers around um, and what's the actual usual and customary practice. And then finally, we also look at what we call patient preference data, which is what's the patient's unique risk aversiveness or risk uh, uh, taking profile and how does that factor in. And this actually, I think, models the way clinicians think. We look at what's the data behind the decision that we make, what's our experience behind this particular decision that we make, and how risk averse or risk tolerant is a particular patient towards a decision. So we take that model and then try to translate that cognitively into an informatics approach to try to make better decisions. So who would use a system like this? We find that there would probably be two users. One is physicians and the other would be patients. Um, you know, physicians for decision support and patients who are looking to verify that they are indeed getting the best treatment that they can in a second opinion fashion or in an exhaustive opinion fashion. So we start out with the unstructured patient data, which is, you know, where we all start with all the EMR files, doctor's files directly from the patient's labs, pathological data. Um, through, you know, either natural language processing or currently for accuracy's sake, for uh, proof of concept, we've actually used a more uh, trained manual approach to get the patient uh, data actually structured into an intelligent ontology. And the ontology that we've built is deductive. It's ground up, and I'll show you examples of this in the next few slides, uh, where basically what we've done is we've looked at all the evidence and the patient cases uh, that we're interested in and built our ontology from the ground up so that it actually connects the evidence, the guidelines, the experience uh, of prior patients to the current patient that we're looking at itself. And we've also, our ontology is also across different domains of the patient experience from their prior history to what therapies they've received to what side effects those therapies they have had to what potential interactions they, those may have with the current planned therapies ahead. So um, once all of this is actually intelligently structured, then we're able to actually run it across what we're calling our evidence and guidelines engines to generate a range of options for physicians for decision support. Um, or if we're actually going to the patients, then we're actually using these engines and then in addition throwing in what we're calling, uh, we, we have something called the expert app, which is a workflow tool which allows for physicians to have a live consensus on those uh, options to generate a single option for the patients themselves. So going into the nitty gritty of the system itself, right? Um, what is our evidence and our guidelines engine? Well, basically our evidence and guidelines engine uh, indexes essentially randomized controlled evidence and internationally approved guidelines, like say, for example, from the National Guideline Clearinghouse, from AHA, NCCN, example, uh, NCCN for example, our working models are currently in oncology. And, uh, but it could, you know, the model would apply to any, any disease process in and of itself. And what we do is we actually index all the inclusion and exclusion criteria of an individual trial itself. I'll actually show you this slide first. Um, in a you know, nested logical expression, which basically allows uh, us to very precisely say what patient would be included and what patient would be excluded from consideration in this trial. So say, for example, in this trial, uh, in our exclusion criteria, we would say if the patient's received more than 300 milligrams per meter square of uh, this drug, she would be excluded. If she's had peripheral neuropathy, she would be excluded. If she's not functional, if she's quite functional and she has metastatic breast cancer, she would be included. So 
these nested loops can get quite complex because it's clinical logic. Uh, and uh, But what it allows us to do is match a patient very specifically to a particular trial that he or she would have qualified to. The second thing that we do is actually calculate um, how relevant is this trial for the particular patient. And for that, we actually use the Table 1 or the demographic data from a paper. This is a simple uh, Table 1. Other papers will give us much more extensive Table 1 data. And Table 1 data, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, just explains who did the trial actually end up enrolling, regardless of its inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for example, this screenshot just shows you that you know a certain trial might have had patients with, you know, only 27 patients with a tumor size that was 0 to 2, but it had 75 patients with a tumor size of 2 to 5. Um, or, you know, a different uh, receptor status or a different grade of a particular tumor. And what that allows us to do is actually map the patient to the demographic data and say how similar was this patient to the patient population that was actually enrolled in that trial. And we, we use a measure that we call the applicability index to actually measure that out. And finally, what we can do is, using the inclusion criteria and the applicability index, if we generate a list of, uh, of specific trials, then uh, we can actually generate a ranked order list of trials and how strong those trials are. So say, for example, in a particular search, we may get 25 results of trials that actually match that patient. And then we can look at how many citations do those papers have, what's the impact factor of that paper, what was the sample size of people studied in that paper, and we can come up with a qualitative ranked order list of the strength of those trials. Um, and one of the beautiful things that we can do once we've identified the trials is actually transpose that, take, go from the trial to the actual treatment arm. So I'm going to show you this uh, screenshot where does my mouse actually work as yes. a pointer? Okay, great, thanks. I'm going to actually show you this uh, screenshot where, for example, there's a particular treatment arm that's indexed. It's a certain chemotherapy regimen, dose taxol and carboplatin. And we've actually indexed the different sample, uh, the sample sizes for each uh, particular um, endpoint and the different event rates. And so what we can actually do with that information is transpose this list of trials into a list of treatments. And so we would say that this particular treatment, EP, has been studied in these three trials, and based on the information that we know about the quality of the trial, the quality of the endpoint, the sample size of the endpoint, and how long the follow-up has actually been going on for, we can generate a qualitative measure for each treatment arm that says how strongly backed by the evidence and guidelines this is. Now, all of this is qualitative. We're not doing quantitative cross-trial comparisons because there's obvious statistical issues with that. But uh, using a qualitative metric, the question we're trying to answer is, how strong is the evidence and guidelines behind a particular treatment option? And we can repeat the same process for the guidelines to come up with a couple of treatment options, two or three treatment options for physicians that would be that would satisfy a couple of key criteria. Has this been tested for this particular patient? Is the patient similar to trials that uh, have tested this? And how applicable um, and how strong is this data for this particular patient? The third set of data that we use is called our experience engine, which is where we're actually using cohorts of patient data. So, you know, we have with one of our collaborations that I'll talk about briefly, we have the last three years worth of, worth of tumor board data for, uh, from a large cancer center. And so what we start doing is we look at um, our structured ontology, which basically converts all that unstructured information into particular fields and variables. This is kind of like, uh, what was uh, Dr. Thing calling it, like a toolbox where, you know, uh, you put in these structured concepts in. And then we're actually um, using that to then search and compare um, with patients who have been treated at that cancer center before to be able to generate a treatment plan based off of similar patients who have gone through uh, an evaluation at that center. So this is just a screenshot of the level of detail that we actually take in. For example, we actually look at treatment opinions themselves as almost an outcome measure. We also independently measure outcomes from follow-ups, three months, six months, 12 months, what's the disease status and what's been happening. But we also look at which physician at what date prescribed what treatment to the patient in a prospective manner without knowing what the uh, outcome would be at that time because that's actually an important uh, criteria in terms of looking forward and making decision making for the next set of patients. So our experience engine basically adds to what the evidence and the guidelines say in terms of being able to narrow down uh, treatment options. Finally, the other uh, utility of actually having a um, structured data system over here is that we can actually present the data in a very clinically easy format to read for physicians at the point of care to be able to look at this instead of looking at a whole EMR record full of 
uh, you know, a lot of variables that may or may not be relevant. We can actually key down on a lot of the specific variables that are actually important for decision making and present a few options that are actually evidence-based, guidelines-based, and relevant for physicians to be able to pick and choose um, or to say whatever else they want to say. So the, uh, our expert app is essentially a workflow tool for them to be able to do this uh, in a much more easy and rapid fashion. Uh, the last part is the patient preference tool, which I was uh, briefly mentioning, which is essentially conjoint analysis based. And this is a way for us, this is a completely different domain of knowledge. It's a way for us to assess a patient's own risk uh, preference and risk tolerance. And conjoint analysis is a marketing technique that's been developed to basically allow uh, for um, risk benefit trade-offs. So the questions that it asks is, say for example, do you want a very harsh treatment that has a lot of efficacy or do you want a mild treatment that may not have a lot of efficacy? And it keeps doing this in a very adaptive way. So for example, over here, it's this is a survey that we've developed that looks at mastectomy versus a lumpectomy of breast conservation surgery, which is a, a more radical surgery. And it allows patients to basically prefer somewhat to the left, somewhat to the right, and it does this in an adaptive manner, so it keeps recursively asking these questions until it can figure out how risk averse or risk tolerant you are. And then that can actually figure into when there are multiple treatment options that are actually similar, that's one of the things that cognitively physicians use to, uh, to make their decisions. So what's the point of actually indexing all this and having this evidence engine and guidelines engine and all of that? Well, we wanted to try and test it out for actual decision making, which is a new case. So our research partner so far has been Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai. It's, uh, we went there because it's a beautiful research center. It's very large. They're very active and academic. They are Asia's largest tertiary care cancer center. They have collaborative tumor boards. They see about 50,000 new patients every year, about 100 patients a week just in breast cancer, which is where we've developed our first model. Um, and it's entirely government and public funding supported, mostly free care for patients. Um, they've been a really, really good research partner for us. So these are sort of some trial findings that we just published uh, at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium uh, just about a month ago, and where we compared our informatics-based process to the traditional process. Um, so right in the center over here, uh, we looked at, say, the patient, and the traditional process is over to the right, where you, know, you take time, energy, and money, to travel all the way to a tertiary care cancer center, you'd come to UCLA, you'd go to Scripps or something to go get your opinion from wherever you live. We'd go through, in our example in oncology, it would be a retrospect, it would be a tumor board uh, that would actually get together and make the decision. In other examples, it might be expert panels, or you'd go through a lot of, you know, seeing a couple of different people in different departments to try to get your decision. And this is not even taking your treatment, this is just uh, getting your decision itself. And uh, in our process, uh, you know, this is, you know, where informatics actually comes in. You know, patient sends us our data, we structure it, and then we actually, for this trial, only use your evidence and guidelines engine. So we just said, what if we only made treatment decisions based on the available randomized evidence and the international guidelines? And we applied our three metrics, which is our patient-specific search, where we match the patient to the trial inclusion exclusion criteria. We looked at the, you know, what the grade of the trials were, what the sample sizes were, what the effect size was, how applicable that uh, trial was to that particular patient. And using that information, which I briefly alluded to, we generated a treatment plan. In this particular trial, we did not use our experience engine or our patient preference engine yet, um, just because we wanted to see what the evidence and guidelines-based approach alone would give us. And when we looked at 224 decisions across from the tumor board uh, on whether or not to give a patient chemotherapy, whether or not to radiate a particular area, whether or not to initiate hormone therapy versus chemo or go for surgery versus, versus chemotherapy, the, what we called major decisions. Uh, we were 100% concordant on 224 out of 224 decisions with the tumor board without having, this is entirely an informatics and data-based approach without actually having an oncologist or a clinician on this side. Uh, when we looked at the specifics of which treatment to use, if you're going to give chemotherapy, what particular regimen would you give? If you're going to radiate, what particular kind of radiation would you give? What protocol would you give? Uh, we matched on 221 out of 224 decisions, and the other three decisions were actually thought to be alternate decisions, not actually wrong decisions by our expert adjudicators as well. So we had a very, very high level of concordance in this limited trial granted, but you know, looking at at least 224 decisions between the traditional process and our and a more informatics-based uh, process. So 
you know, we were very excited to present the results of this trial and it was actually really, really well received at the San Antonio Breast Symposium and we've launched two more trials with the, with the center um, to look at our experience engine and the other components of our system as well. So, I, the part of the reason why I sort of wanted to go through my slides a little bit more quickly was to allow some more time for a conversation afterwards because I think you guys all have a lot of questions. But the three main areas that I actually um, thought, uh, think that there are quite interesting here is, one, how do you actually build these ontologies that are across different areas of the patient uh, data uh, domains themselves. I mean, I know you guys think a lot more about genomic and proteomic data and integrating that with clinical data. For me, even clinical data itself is heterogeneous, comes from different pools of areas, and how do you actually build ontologies that, that pulls all of these areas together? Um, and then once you have that, how do you actually do the predictive modeling across heterogeneous data sources when you're comparing, you know, analysis of evidence to analysis of expert opinion to analysis of guidelines and risk trade-offs? How do you actually build models that compare these things across different data sources and a lot of this hasn't been you know quite fleshed out yet and most of the approach we've taken is very qualitative just to avoid some of the quantitative risks but there's more work to be done over there and then finally the quintessential question of any kind of modeling how do you actually say how similar a patient is to an, to a population or a cohort of patients that you're analyzing across how many domains and what degree of similarity do you need to meet and what are the criteria to do that and these are all open scientific questions that you know I'm looking forward to collaborating with the expertise in the BD2K Center try and explore and learn um, a lot more about which would actually help make this you know decision making process or research driven process uh, using an informatics approach much much stronger so I'm going to wrap up the formal part of the presentation over here and try to open up for um, uh, questions at this point and uh, leave it up to you. All right. Thank you, Naresh. That was uh, very, very interesting. Um, okay. Uh, are there any questions? Hi. Uh, Naresh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. This is Carol Watson. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Watson. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Loud and okay. Hi, Naresh. That was, that was absolutely fantastic. I have two questions. One is, um, I completely understand using the empiric data, that's what we base all of our decisions on. I definitely understand using the patient preference. What I'm having trouble with is using the um, sort of local community standard data because as you and I both know, that can be highly variable, sometimes evidence-based, sometimes not. Um, and it makes sense that you would get very strong concordance if you include that. Do you know what your data would look like or your results would look like if you don't include that? So that's a great question, Dr. Watson. I think both of us and a lot of the clinicians realize that, quote, unquote, uh, uh, what's the word, expert uh, expert opinion is, or level, quote, unquote, level four data is obviously how we used to practice medicine before this evidence-based uh, era kind of has started. And there's a lot of issues with it, as we well know. Um, so let me answer that question in two ways. Number one, that was one of the reasons why this trial that we just completed did not use experience data. We only looked at the evidence and the, uh, hold on, let me just uh, see if I can pull that slide back up, why we only used uh, the evidence and the guidelines alone. Um, and uh, for this particular trial, we did not use the experience engine just to see if we would still get concordance if we just looked at the evidence and the guidelines. The other piece of this is, however, even though we would love to use evidence and guidelines, um, unfortunately, that only fits about 60 or 70 percent of the patients who fit the molds for very traditional patterns that have been tested in large randomized trials. And in cardiology, it may be closer to maybe 80, 90 percent. I'm not sure. In oncology, it's closer to 60, 70 percent. Um, but the problem is there's a lot of nuanced cases, corner cases, complex cases where only certain expert centers have seen like hundreds of thousands of cases of a particular kind of intervention or a particular kind of resynchronization therapy or a particular kind of medication use. Or, you know, say for example, if you're looking at pulmonary hypertension, you'd have to come to a center like UCLA and look at the thousands of patients who have been treated here. And there's no level one data for these patients. So that, therefore, this data set actually becomes something that's actually really, really important to both capture and look at with the caveat that you are understanding that um, that it is a local community standard. The local community that we're picking, we're trying to stick to tertiary care centers. We're trying to stick to centers like, you know, the largest center in Asia and looking at, you know, UCLA, et cetera. And obviously, it wouldn't make sense for us in any future trial to compare 
what uh, concordance between UCLA's prior decisions and their current decisions, because then we're just basically replicating the system. The idea would then be to say, right. if we use UCLA expert data on pulmonary hypertension to actually predict a result when the evidence and the guidelines are not sufficient, would a community practitioner, would a community cardiologist who's out in Fresno get benefit from it, right? Would a community practitioner who's using Epic in Fresno right. running it, would they benefit from it? So that's kind of our thoughts on that, uh, on that, if that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, it does. And I think that makes a lot of sense for oncology because I do think exactly as you say, Every cancer is different. The trials are small, and there's a lot of experiential data, and that goes into decision making. In cardiovascular, I think it'll be different. First of all, you will have to scale it up enormously because we have hundreds and millions of years of patient data that are available, and we have pretty good evidence about what works. And many of many of our trials have included exactly the type of patients we see. It's typically a 60-year-old chubby white male. I mean, it's not going to take into account the majority of women, the majority of ethnicities and things like that, but I think it will be a different beast when you look at cardiovascular diseases. You know, it actually makes... That, thank you, but that... Sorry, I, I was going to say that it actually makes our life a lot easier because uh, the experiential data is the hardest data to get with all the patient privacy I bet. contracts. Right. <laughs> But it really is fabulous. I mean, I can't even tell you how exciting this whole thing is for many reasons, but I'm really excited to, excited to see where this goes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Really appreciate your comments. Any other questions on uh, at this point from anybody else in the in the panel? I mean. Uh, get the guy. I, I'm at UCLA. I'm going to continue to be working and collaborating with Dr. Ping and Dr. Watson as well. And my contact information is up here on the slides as well. And uh, get the guys over in Boston, but she's also available. She's a lot of the technical brains behind this. Um, um, but uh, this is a good time if there's uh, any particular thoughts, concerns, questions that have come up during the presentation. Um, this is Andrew, who I have a question. Can you go back to uh, that slide that you were just on? Yep. So, um, I mean, cl clearly that this is an impressive result. Can you go into a little bit more detail on actually, you know, the patient populations, um, you know, what types of cancers were these, how many, uh, yep. you know, uh, how many different types, and then also for the specific treatments, like, you know, for the tumor board and your system, how many therapies were uh, was the system selecting from, I guess? Right. So actually, that's a great question, and thank you for asking, because it's actually impossible to measure the rigor of the trial from just the slide alone. Um, I'll be happy to actually send in our full abstract, as well as, you know, once we have a manuscript written up, I'll be able to send that in. But I can send in the abstract as well, which goes into a little bit more of that data in our actual results table itself. But to answer your question briefly, the way we looked at this was uh, we basically, this was uh, around uh, 80 uh, or so patients. And in those 80 patients, there were about 224 decisions because every patient in oncology gets exploded into, you know, do you need surgical decisions, do you need radiation decisions, chemo decisions, hormone decisions. It's a multidisciplinary um, area which you look at. All of these patients were all the way from stage one all the way up to I think it was stage 3C patients. Uh, the center didn't want to include stage 4 patients at this time because there wasn't, there's not a whole lot of data behind them and we would have to dig into our experience data set for you know second line, third line therapies in these metastatic patients. So this was from stage 1 through stage 3C which can still be very complex because there's a lot of local treatments that are uh, different in um, in oncology, and I'm just saying this for the background because I, some of us are, are, you know, have a little bit more of an oncology background than others. The um, third uh, piece of this, so when we broke it down into 224 decisions, it broke out pretty evenly, and I, I wish I had my table of results over here to show you, but I'll, I'll make sure to email it out to the group. Uh, we broke it out into uh, these individual areas of chemo, radiation, hormones, and surgery, and then we sent, uh, we looked at this in two different ways. The first question was, you know, is this actually resectable or not? If it's resectable, what kind of resection would you do? So then is it resectable or not would be the big question. And then if it is resectable, uh, you know, what kind of resection would you do is what we call the minor treatment. Now, we repeated the same thing for chemo for radiation and hormones. 
um, which is uh, where we said that, you know, would you treat this with chemotherapy, would you treat this with radiation or not, and then which particular treatment would you use. The patients that were selected were patients that the tumor board, the, the, the cancer center selected in a blinded fashion to us. They chose these 80 patients because they thought that these were complex patients who had two or more options that were available. So that was part of the inclusion criteria of our trial was that the tumor board had to think that there were at least two, if not more, alternative treatment strategies that were viable for this patient. Um, and this was then sent to us in a blinded, de-identified manner, and then we generated our treatment plan and sent it back to the cancer center in a blinded, de-identified manner, and then it was just mapped for concordance. When we were looking for concordance, the way we defined concordance was basically, again, on these two categories, major and minor. On minor, it had to be very specific concordance. It had to match the same category of drug for the same time and stuff like that. On the major, it would just have to uh, match basically the intent of treatment and the, um, uh, how do I say this, so the approach that we would take. Say, say, for example, in a patient who has, didn't have any lymph nodes, who had a very benign looking tumor, uh, the complexity of the question would then be, do you treat this patient with chemotherapy or not? And, and part of that would depend on some of the other receptors and genetic data from the tumor itself. And so our predictions would be mapped against the tumor board decisions because that patient had two viable options of chemotherapy or not. So I don't know if that, if that begins to answer some of the questions that you have. Obviously, this slide is meant to be just a synopsis, and I'm, I'm happy to send the table across as well. Yeah, no, those are exactly the types of issues that I'm, uh, I'm very curious about. I mean, um, maybe just, just one follow-up question. Um, can you talk a little bit about the scale of the training data that went into this? Okay, so uh, essentially we've indexed the randomized trials in, um, in, in, uh, in breast oncology. There's about, we've indexed about, I think our set has about 2,500 trials. It goes back to 1980-something. We chose to ignore trials before that as not being quite relevant to clinical practice today. Um, it, our guidelines, uh, we have three or four sets of guidelines, the NCCN, ASCO, ESMO, all of that when you translate them into individual rules, like each guideline when it gets exploded into an individual rule applicable to a particular patient, is about you know 25,000 rules, I'd say probably approximately. Um, patient data, the experience engine, we have about seven or 8,000 discrete patients from uh, prior tumor board decisions, although we didn't use that for this particular trial, and that each patient then explodes into usually three or four decisions, so about 24, 25,000 high quality tumor board decisions from, that are fully vetted from a, from, from a single cancer center at this point. Um, so the, and then expert app, we've actually for our workflow tool, with, because it's a live consensus and it's only applicable to prospective patients who are coming in with complex questions, where there's still uncertainties. We've done about 500 or so decisions where uh, patients from all around the world, from like Bangladesh and Mozambique and South Africa and Russia have sent in their cases to this cancer center online and they've, we've converted it, generated an opinion, sent it off to experts to give us a live consensus using our structured format and we've done about 400 or 500 uh, prospective global online cases that way. So. Um, that's the kind of sense of scale that we have for, uh, for or at least for the for this uh, working model. Great, thanks. Just a comment. Oh yeah, uh, so Githika just wanted to also add in Dr. Watson that uh, part of the reason that uh, we're really interested in using experience uh, data is because of the, uh, this is right, I forgot, is side effects and toxicity data because unfortunately the evidence is very clean, you know this very well, it excludes patients with kidney disease, excludes patients with, you know, plagalopathies, excludes patients on Coumadin, all of these are maybe not all the cardiology trials, but at least the onc ones. So, no, that's true, yes, you know, that's true. So then once that's very true. So for modeling, so get the go saying that's also part of the reason we really had to bring in the experience data is at least for these patients who are excluded from these trials automatically, we have a data set to fall back on. That is our level four evidence. It's like kind of our low level evidence that we can reach for. That makes sense, yes. Thank you. Any thoughts on, uh, uh, from the audience on uh, different, you know, these questions that I've listed at the end are actually, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I just should move. Okay. 
Okay. I'm trying to move to these uh, uh, questions that I've listed at the end since I have a couple of minutes here. Uh, where, you know, I, these are, I think, you know, the big challenges in sort of this area of searching across different domains and modeling. And uh, I'd be happy to start looking into people who want to explore this further. You know, I, again, we're pretty disease agnostic. Both Gitika and I are really interested in the approach that we're taking, and we're building a model that should be scalable across diseases, hopefully. Um, the working, we, we had to build a working proof to show a use case, which is, and breast cancer was a good one to start with. Um, but I'm actually really interested in trying to solve, or, or not solve, but at least work on and answer these questions over the next couple of years over here. And I'm really looking forward to people in the, in the, in the UCLA and BD2K community to, uh, to work with on these questions. So, uh, you know, anybody who has particular interest in either the ontology component or the modeling component or just sort of assessing the assessing biostatistical similarity between patients and cohorts, I'd, I'd love to have more detailed conversations on, on these pieces with you. Well, well let me uh, just comment real quickly on, on that piece, because I was looking at these set of questions, too. Um, you know, there are a few opportunities with um, other BD2K centers as well. Again, not to exclude, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, interactions within the center, but uh, when you talk about organizing clinical data, immediately what I think of is uh, the UCSC BD2K Center, mm -hmm. for the Global Alliance. I was going to say the same thing, yeah. yeah. Global Alliance for Genomic Health, where it's all about defining the, the APIs for uh, data interchange. And when you're talking about aggregating uh, data from so many different centers, right, standardization is, of course, mm -hmm. very key. And so if you're not already um, hooked up with the Global Alliance, okay. uh, they have a very active and public uh, mailing, or, uh, discussion board, which actually is their code repository on GitHub. Okay. Um, should uh, get involved there. Okay, we'll do. That's great. So, yeah, Naresh, um, I've already made some contacts to them down there. We should definitely plan to try to either make a trip or try to get a okay. uh, formal meeting with them. I love that. Could you do me a favor, Naresh? Can you email me that presentation? We'll do. The second one that comes to mind, right, when you talked about predictive modeling, um, that is sort of one of the emphases of the Pittsburgh Center, where they're trying to do causality analysis. And I, I don't uh, know all of the details, but uh, I know Pepe actually has had quite a few discussions with them. But that, you know, uh, in as much as you'd be willing to share, you know, the um, some of the, the the data that you mm -hmm. have, some of these large knowledge bases, they may be, be able to um, sort of apply some of their, their causality modeling tools. Okay. This is this is all highly Andrew, valuable. So Andrew, it's Pei Pei. Hi Dr. Pei. You're very famous, Pei Pei, but Hi. yeah. So uh, just a quick comment on the uh, predictive model. So Pittsburgh uh, has a very strong emphasis uh, on that particular element. So if we want to add another clinical cohort to it, we need to communicate with them before we do that because we did give them four clinical data sets already. Okay. Um, our center with uh, Wei Wang, there's also an element of predicting outcomes, but that's focused primarily at this moment on cardiovascular and LVAD models. We could definitely see how parallel studies can be built. Mm -hmm. But at this moment, the way I see it is uh, if it's OK uh, with um, Carol and everyone else, probably we have later on a more detailed discussion on what specific studies that we could collaborate on. And what are the studies that are the priorities to proceed first? So, so Pepe, do you mean in the context, I, I mean, one of the things that seems reasonable, right, is to just try to get as much of the cardiovascular data, that, that clinical data that, that is present within our consortium into um, this, this decision support type of system, uh, and let's just see what comes out. 
So there is definitely policy issues, you probably know. Um, at this moment, I don't know the approval process for the clinical data if they would be coming from India. And I do need to clear that with UCLA IRB. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've been told repeatedly about this particular issue. It's different if we just have built a tool and if the tool wants to be shared and applied by other centers, that's quite okay. That's a different issue. Then we're just exporting a tool. We're not importing data. That's just a policy issue. I think David probably also has more understanding of it as well. So, um, Nuresh, understanding that, that you had to pick a focus um, when you were going to these clinics in, um, in India, uh, and oncology seems a perfectly reasonable one, I mean, is it possible, actually, <clears throat> to go back to some of those clinical organizations and, and uh, do a similar study of, of cardiovascular disease? It, it would, you know, it totally would be possible, and then also over here, you know, between sort of my networks at both UCLA and all of you, I think we could figure something out. I think I, I, I can have further conversations with Dr. Watson as well. I mean, part of this is the evidence is actually the evidence and guidelines are in the public domain. So uh, really the, the clinical data that would be needed for testing would be uh, some amount of uh, highly high quality data from expert centers uh, like UCLA, for example, or our collaborators in India. Um, and uh, some clinical data to actually test the system out and sort of see what use it does when you cross domains. Um, so I think there are opportunities for collaboration both over here and in India for that. I'm happy to take that with uh, Dr. Ping and Dr. Watson and see what we come up with, I think. Yeah, and um, can I say, Pei Pei, exactly what you mentioned is one of the big challenges of BD2K. Using all of this unstructured clinical data that we have, which is really a treasure trove, to try to make important decisions, clinical decisions from. So that's part of what we have to figure out as a whole community, not just for this specific project. Oh yeah, yeah. These are these are challenges in, in the informatics community in general. They're very big picture. <laughs> right. Well then maybe let me ask a, a very pointed question. I mean um, you founded a company, so I guess at the end of the day, uh, right, I mean, you know, this is a for-profit company, so how do you see you interacting with sort of the BBPK community, which inherently, right, I mean, uh, a lot of what we do has to end up in, in ways that are publicly consumable? I think it's, that's, that's actually a great question. It's something that, you know, obviously I've put a lot of thought into as well. Part of the reason why this was founded as a company was because four or five years ago when I was trying to work with the data sets in India and actually get people to get in and start doing the work um, as a resident itself, uh, a private company actually made the most sense in terms of being effective, fast at actually moving through and, and getting agreements in and being able to have people in India who can abstract data and put this stuff in and do the trials and go forward. Um, in terms of collaborations with BD2K and trying to test different models out, um, our, you know, our basic premise and modeling is kind of done. What we would be doing would be trying to say, how does this apply to cardiovascular? How can we make the models better, et cetera? And I think it's an open question as to see, you know, how to do, how to make this collaboration actually work out in a way that, you know, then can be, you know, publishable and can be shared with other people in the community. Uh, because ultimately what Kitika and I are interested in is how do you actually build a decision support model that can be pushed onto physicians or patients at the front lines to be able to help them make decisions. And, you know, we'll have to figure out the nuances of what's a um, both rapid and uh, effective way of actually making those uh, making that come to fruition. And I'm, I'm happy to work that out with, uh, you know, the IRB office here or the IP offices over here and see, you know, how those collaborations would need to be formally structured. Uh, but I don't necessarily see that that should become an impediment to collaborations in general. Um, yeah, but I mean, so to, it, ahead, it is in a sense. So we won't be able to start the studies until the IRB is approved. Correct. 
But what we can do definitely for collaboration is some of the tools and the approaches, if they're still in developing, but if they're looking for beta testing sites, you could sort of be the bridge connecting these tools to the data in India. Um, I'm a bit sensitive about getting the data here. Mm -hmm. um, Andrew knows about it because we've had another very close collaborators who's had the data set, but at the end the way we dealt with it is that it will be a beta testing site. Mm -hmm. And we would consider it as a consortium activity. We'll loop in honey, but not as our DSR activity. So there's just some administrative issues that we, we deal with. Sure. But largely if the tools are developing by the center and you're interested in any of the tools as the BD2K fellow, as what uh, Dr. Watson has uh, had that invitation with you, then you're 100% on top of the list to be beta testing these tools. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Ping. That sounds reasonable and I'm, you know, I think that's uh, actually quite uh, quite something that we can uh, discuss further and take forward. I don't want to... Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Is there someone else from the company or from India you think it's possible could help you beta testing the tools or you're essentially need to be doing it all by yourself? Um, we have, I mean, there's, I mean, Gitika and I are basically the company. We have people in India who are actually like analysts who are helping us out. Um, mm -hmm. But we, you know, we can expand our resources to accommodate for what needs to happen to be able to solve this problem and to do better decision support. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's not inconceivable to be able to expand our resources and to try and uh, uh, work on some beta testing. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's the first step to go. And okay. then while we're moving forward, we could see how more intimate collaboration can be initiated. Um, we, we can have some of these discussions. We definitely want to have as many people to collaborate as possible, but we're also constrained by the IRB regulation that what we can do and cannot do. I completely understand. I have one uh, more question, Narvesh, actually, because uh, it's actually similar to the comments that Dr. Watson gave in the beginning, but yeah. I was wondering, most of your patients that you included are mostly from Asia, actually. Correct. And I was wondering how the different typical patient population you find over the world how they would affect your uh, predictive modeling studies uh, because you know like I think the population in India they may look completely different than the, the way they express breast cancer in Europe or, True. or in, in Africa. True. So the way we account for that is in two ways. One is which which is why we stand on two or three four legs and not just on one just on patient data alone. We're sitting on now unfortunately most of the trials are actually developed in the West and tested in the West. So it's the reverse problem. When we go to India they say, well you're using all this trial data that's been tested in the Western population in, in, in an Indian setting. So the trial data and the guidelines are generally developed for a Western, for an American and European population, which is one leg that we sit on. And of course, the patient preference is very unique to that individual patient and their risk benefit trade-offs. And if we need to do sort of some kind of live consult, that's also very unique to the situation. The only cluster uh, that is actually becomes very specific to the center itself is the experience data set that we're talking about. And this is why both Gitik and I recognize the need to be able to work with, we only want to work with really, really high quality centers because we don't want to be capturing intelligence that is coming from, you know, centers that aren't already up to date with the evidence and the guidelines and have large volumes. But we do need to expand across different centers so that we have a leg, say for example, a couple of centers in America, perhaps a center in China, perhaps a center in Europe that we're actually collaborating with to get these different patient pools so that when we're then mapping a patient, we actually have more patients to map onto. So that is 
that's a scale problem to me more than a uh, center problem per se. It's just that you know we're starting with the work proof of concept, so we're a single center tied right now. But part of our goal is to actually have more affiliations to build out that experience data set. Thanks. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to our second presentation. That was a great presentation by Rush. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for your time. Uh, if you have it, thank you, Narash. It's an outstanding presentation. Thank you. If you have any uh, further questions, uh, feel free to post on the message box, and we'll uh, try to get it to Narash. Or you can uh, email him uh, on the slide that's posted. So next, uh, All right, so we'll yeah. move on to our second presentation. Our, next, our second presentation will be presented by David Miam. David received his MD and PhD in the Erasmus University in the Netherlands. In parallel to his PhD, uh, Dr. Liam worked as a clinical fellow in cardio thoracic surgery. Uh, David has been working with Dr. Ping on cardio protection against ischemia reperfusion injury, and more currently also on cardiac re remodeling and heart failure. He is currently working on the clinical studies corner, coordinator for the BUTK Center of Excellence. Today he will be pre presenting about working with patient information in clinical and basic research. Without further ado, allow me to introduce David. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, after that uh, great talk from Naresh, uh, I'll, I'd like to talk more about householding aspects and administration aspects. Let's uh, let's upload the presentation first. So uh, I think it's important for all of us as a center that we are aware of all the administrative aspects and how to work with patient information because it's uh, you know it's very easy to make mistakes and before you know it we you know like so I think we need to be all on the same page in how we perceive and work with all this patient information. How, um, how does this work? Can I go to? Okay. So um, just these. Left and right. Okay, left and right. So first is so uh, aside from financial information, it's actually the medical data that are the most sensitive and the most highly regulated information that is in existence. And so, in an effort to hold organizations accountable for medical data privacy and to help them prepare their system to strategically handle sensitive data, the United States government created uh, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. That was pretty reasonable uh, recently actually in 1996 this is known as the HIPAA and uh, this act set the precedent for protecting medical data and privacy information and then in 2009 they also set up the health information technology for economic and clinical health and this is more known as the high tech act and these measures offer technical standards for meeting regulations and provide enforcement mechanisms to penalize companies that put uh, uh, patient information at risk. So um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, contains provisions to protect the confidentiality and security of personally identifiable information that arises in the course of providing health care and also actually education and research, which concerns us, in order to understand how so in order to understand how HIPAA affects research, there are uh, a few important terms uh, that are defined by law. So first we have the covered entity, which is the organization that has to comply with the HIPAA. So in this case, that is us as a center related to UCLA. The University of California is a hybrid covered entity because it provides the three aspects that involve uh, patient information. So uh, we provide healthcare, 
we provide education and we provide research. Then you have the HIPAA privacy rule which can, uh, governs protected health information known as PHA, I'll abbreviate that, uh, which is defined as information that can uh, be linked to a particular person, uh, with a person that is identifiable and that arises in the course of providing healthcare service educational research. When PHI is communicated inside a covered entity, this is called a use of information. So when we are working with the patient information and the data within the center, we call that, uh, with, uh, we call that the use of information. When we transfer the PHI to another organization, uh, then we call that disclosure. So these are typical uh, terms that we, uh, that we will work with. Uh, HIPAA allows both use and disclosure of PHA for research purposes, but uh, such uses and disclosures have to follow the HIPAA guidance and have to be part of a research plan that is reviewed and report, uh, approved by an institutional research board, the IRB. So uh, um, HIPAA affects only that research which uses, creates, and discloses protected health and in general, there are two ways uh, a research study would involve PHI. Uh, first, uh, the study involves review of medical records as one or the only source of research information. This could involve both in retrospective and prospective studies. Uh, and one example is when a researcher contacts a participant's physician to obtain or verify some aspects of a person's health history. So. Um, in the second case, the study, uh, the study creates a new medical record when a health service is being performed as part of the research, and this is particularly the case in clinical trials, which can also involve PHIs. And one example is the testing of a new way of diagnosing a health condition or a new drug or device or treating a health condition. Um, the HIPAA permits the use or disclosure of PHI for research under the following circumstances and conditions. First is if the subjects whose PHI is involved in the study has granted specific written permission through an authorization or an informed consent. And the second case is when the IRB has granted a waiver of the authorization requirement. And third, if the PHI has been de-identified in accordance with the standards set by the HIPAA. And if the information is released in the form of a limited data set which certain when, with certain identifiers removed, which I will uh, elaborate more on, uh, and with data use agreement between the researcher and the covered entity. So um, there are, uh, um, there, there's a possibility when the HIPAA can be waived, actually, and although it is always preferred to get permission to use an individual's PHI, HIPAA permits research using PHI without obtaining consent, and we call this the authorization by HIPAA. In order to do this, the research must be reviewed and approved by an established IRB, and the HIPAA requires that IRBs review the uh, project to ensure it meets all the following criteria. So there are nine criteria that I will not uh, mention here, but uh, this presentation slides, these presentation slides will be sent to all, uh, to everyone here, so you can review it at your own pace. But a typical scenario is then, um, is when, for instance, here in our center, we gather a lot of uh, um, uh, cardiac tissue from the patients during surgery, and these tissues are going to pathology, and this is just part of the usual uh, procedure. It's just part of the routine, and it does not involve any risk, so there's minimal risk for the patient. In that case, we do not need to notify the patient that we're taking their tissues for research. We just have to de-identify them. So the human subjects that are involved uh, are not aware of that, and this is all approved by the IRB. So that's just a, a typical scenario uh, that, uh, as an example. So this is a very important slide that I want to you know, discuss. There are 18 identifiers of the individual that needs to be removed in, in order to call it a de-identification. So uh, I think all these 18 identifiers that are here in the slide are very, uh, you know, it's very clear. Uh, there's no uh, discussion about it. Uh, so if, if you work with your patient data, make sure that these 18 identifiers are not there. And particularly I want to uh, focus on item number one, names, it makes sense, but also make sure there's no initials. So it's easy to make mistakes when you uh, leave initials there. 
Another one that is very uh, typical is uh, the, the number, uh, number three. So you're not allowed to uh, leave any dates in your uh, patient information and in your data, except for years. But So make sure that uh, you remove all the date of birth from every patient or uh, the typical date when the patient came into the hospital or when a certain procedure was done. Officially, according to HIPAA, you're not allowed to leave, that, uh, leave those dates. You need to remove it. Uh, I've seen mistakes here that people just thought like, oh, date of birth is not a big deal, so we'll just leave it. So it's not the case. If an inspector or something uh, finds it out, uh, that's not good. Uh, another typical one is uh, the medical record number, item number eight. Uh, I also have seen these mistakes that uh, people leave medical re uh, record numbers because they think it's not an identifier, but it is. So make sure there's no medical record number. It's, it's unique to the patient, so in that way you can uh, trace the patient's identity and you know, like make sure these 18 identifiers are removed. Um, the HIPAA requires that research involving protected health information use physical, technical, administrative safeguards. The physical safeguard is, uh, so make sure that your uh, data are locked behind cabinets and locked in one room only. And there's a restriction of access only to those project staff who need to access the files. Nobody else can access those. And paper records should not be kept in public. It can only be in a certain room and, and kept, uh, you know, in, in one room behind uh, uh, in, in, in a locked cabinet. And then you have the technical safeguard. So make sure that all the computers that you're using are encrypted, uh, the computers that contain uh, medical records. They have to be encrypted, and all the files also need to be encrypted. And also, it's good to have uh, proof that you encrypted your computer, but because in case your computer gets stolen, then you can always report to the NIH or report to the IRB that you actually have your computer encrypted, so, so that you're actually protected and you follow the rules. And then there's an administrative safeguard. Uh, that's the use of sign, a signed confidentiality agreement and publication of policies regarding the confidentiality and security of research data. So it's more an informed consent. That's the paperwork. Um, then you did, so it's also important to discuss the CITI training. And I think many of uh, people here uh, already did that together uh, with me. I think I remember. So the collaborative institutional training initiative, the CIT training, is required for all researchers involved involved in human studies. So if you have taken this before 2009, you have uh, a cert actual certificate which you can upload. But after 2009, everything was electronically online. And I believe everyone in the center now has completed the, the training. Uh, so this is just an example how that looks like. You go to the uh, online website, which is, uh, which is here on the, you can see it here. You just go there, and then you follow the steps, and then uh, you create your own account, and uh, it, will, it will guide you through. If you have any questions, you can always contact us uh, to, to go through this. And then this is an example of a, a completed HIPAA training. This is my own uh, record. And then every training module, you can just download it, and then, and then officially you are, uh, you're, an able, you're able to work with patient data. And you can also get approval in the IRB after you've done your CITI HIPAA online training. So then I just want to shortly talk about the uh, IRBs. The Institutional Review Board of a University of Hospital is, re is required for federal regulations to review all human subject research activities. And uh, it is formally designated to approve, monitor, and review biomedical and behavioral research involving human subjects, also known as an ethics committee. And um, <clears throat> what the IRB actually do, does is it reviews research protocols and related materials, often conducting some form of risk-benefit analysis in an attempt to determine whether or not the research should be done. And a key goal of the IRB is to protect human subjects from physical uh, or psychological harm. So this is all the key personnel that uh, fits into an IRB protocol. It's very, you know, it's good to have that in mind. We have the principal investigator. Uh, the princ principal investigator can uh, designate two co-principal investigators and a, co uh, and a PI proxy. Uh, then you have the study coordinator, who is typically the key member of the research team, who manages the daily activities of the study. And then you have the co-investigators, uh, who are actually conducting 
and design uh, all the protocols and the scientific uh, uh, issues. And then you have the research assistant who actually does more the technical aspects. So what is important here is that we need to, that to keep in mind that it is actually the principal investigator and the PI proxy that are responsible for the safety of the human subjects and also for the protection of the PHI. So, for instance, uh, what happens is if data that we retrieve from uh, one center under a specific IRB protocol, if it's transferred to, let's say, EBI, then and uh, some uh, and in EBI, um, you know, there's a, a breach of patient privacy. Then it is still the principal investigator from UCLA here, uh, from that specific IRB protocol that is responsible. So basically, that's actually the, the message uh, from this slide. And then uh, what is important is there's also a data and safety monitoring board. This is actually per NIH regulations. Uh, so you need to assemble a data and safety monitoring board. These are certain people in the protocol that oversee the safety of the patients and also oversee the safety of the privacy of the patient information. And uh, so every time when you have to uh, give uh, a report, uh, an annual report to the NIH, the NIH actually wants uh, a data safety monitoring board, uh, you know, uh, um, approval too. And and here's an example that I see that how it is in an IRB how that is designated. And then uh, so the take home message because this these are all terms that I just shoot on people and and uh, you know but it's you know basically I, I want to make it simple. Take home message is ensure that all investigators in your team are familiar with the HIPAA with the HIPAA privacy rules and the definition of protected health information and how to identify medical patient information for research. Uh, ensure that all research pro proposals and pro uh, protocols involving human subjects and or medical patient information is reviewed and approved by your IRB and ensure that all investigators in your team who will work with uh, patient information are trained and certified by the CITI and ensure that all investigators in your team who will work with uh, patient information are reviewed, approved, and included into an approved IRB protocol. So that's basically the take-home message. And I put in a couple of websites for information, and you can always contact us if, if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's outstanding. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the information, and uh, I think Brian and uh, Vincent will send those slides to everyone on the technical call. And so that actually would constitute part of our IRB training for the investigator team. And David will periodically uh, have other people join the call and perhaps either do the same presentation uh, to those who missed the call today. Yeah, we will do that. Yeah, we will upload the video so everybody will be able to see it as as well with this as as well yeah. with the slides by themselves. Yeah, it's uh, this particular presentation. It's a mandate for everyone to see it, so they don't have an option not to see it. It's part of the IRB training. Thank you. I'm going to join. A, my next call. Appreciate. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, for attention. All right. Uh, thank you, David. Um, oh, there's one one other uh, comment I'd like to make about the uh, about the conference series. Um, yeah, we thought we might be sending out too many emails. We don't want anyone to tune out, so we're going to send out just one email a week. And um, in the email, we provide a link to the. Um, uh, the Trello board where we're uploading all of the files. And uh, I think I a link to that um, earlier in the chat box. Uh, so if you go to that link, um, I'll just I'll just show you guys here on the screen. Um, you can see the conferences from the previous week, the upcoming conferences, and in each one uh, there'll be um, you'll, you'll see uh, the, the agenda, the minutes, the PowerPoint slides, and then there should be actual um, uh, files, so either a, a, a WMV or an MP4 file uh, with all the audio and video.
And also, you can leave you can leave any comments if you want in the. Uh, and also here in general information, you can see uh, just the the guide to go to meeting and the general conference guide we have. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? So, uh, does you require any password? I just clicked, and it said like uh, "world not found," and uh, maybe do I, do I have to create like a Trello uh, the account to view uh, the page? Hmm. Let me see. I you I, I you might. Uh, is anybody else having that problem? <clears throat> When I click the link, uh, it, it said uh, it's a private uh, board, so uh, do I have to create an account? Yeah, so it, it's available to people who are members of the um, BJP project, which is like a larger uh, board. Um, you have members. Okay, we, we will make sure that everybody um, that we will we will go back and make sure that everybody who's uh, in these conferences um, has an invitation to this board. I thought we had so, everybody, but I guess not. Yeah, so uh, that's the link you sent. Uh, I just put onto uh, the message box, and uh, I clicked that link you sent, uh, but it didn't work. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're right. We we do have a, we do have a limited list of people who are invited, but I guess we didn't get everyone. So we will. Oh, it says Robin Robin Park three. Yeah, but uh, the, the email, email seems to be I don't know the, the correct email. I don't know how how I can. Oh, okay. How, how can I verify that you know uh, I'm. Uh, yeah, that's why I see your name here. So I I don't know. I will. Um, I just simply click the link, and uh, and then it's not working. Hmm. Hmm. Are, are you signed into Trello with this uh, Robin Park three account? What's a Robin Park three? Oh, you did the account? Yeah, I see uh, that list of the members. So do I have to uh, log in by that username? Yes. But uh, but what what is the password? Hi, Robin. Uh, I think we'll send out. Uh, do you have maybe using? Uh, you have more than one email. We'll, we'll try to send out um, send out a new invitation to you using uh, your alternate email. If that's the problem. Uh, I, I don't know which, which email, but uh, you sent to. You. Uh, but w when I took uh, to log in, look like uh, I needed to have a password. Okay. Yeah, I think you'll have to. So what, what we'll do is we'll send, we'll send you another email uh, inviting you to the project, and then it'll probably prompt you to create a Trello account. Oh, oh, you don't have. That, that, that'll be great. That'll be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and then uh, uh, Sarah Scruggs, we will invite you as well. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll try to make sure we get everybody who's on this conference.
Okay. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, I, I thank you all for for coming. Um, and we'll just we'll remain on the line here um, uh, until ten. Uh, so if you have any questions between now and then about the presentations, uh, we'll be happy to answer those questions. Right. Thank you, everybody, again.